that cons consumerism as a measure of success is ostensibly bad because first, it crowds out other conceptions of success and denies individuals the rightful ability to choose that measure of success for themselves. Secondly, we think it's not only self-perpetuating in the short term, but in the long term, we think it's self defeating as well. Now, this sounds really cool. I'm going to explain that all in our substantives. I'm going to be talking about, firstly, inequality. Secondly, crowding out. Thirdly, how it's unfair from the beginning and is therefore principally unfair. And lastly, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to trace the origins of consumerism as a measure of success and why it's really, really bad. First point, inequality. We got to appreciate that inequality has been at record levels for the past 30 to 40 years. In the United States, for example, ever since the White Man Act was passed in the 1970s, real wages have not increased even though profit margins for big corporations have. We've seen the corporate capture of political parties in the United States, for example, by things like political lobbying or by people, for example, the Koch brothers coming in funding both sides. We have also seen how the top 1% of societies are largely in control of the levers of power in society at the expense of the other 99%. And it's not just exclusive to the United States. In the United Kingdom as well, the reason why the Birmingham riots occurred was because people in the lower strata of society were dissatisfied with the inequalities that they've been seeing. If you go on to the online citizen of the Masin Review in Singapore, that is our equivalent here. Now, why is that a problem? That is a problem because, firstly, the kind of narrative that it creates as a result. When you allow for people to use consumerism as a measure of success, it, it furnishes or it shapes a kind of narrative, narrative where people view poor people as just not being hardworking enough to have reached that same level of success just the way they did. You make people, you allow people to be looked down upon. It's very Ayn Randish in a way, right? Because I've achieved these things on my own accord. The reason why you're poor and you aren't as successful as I am is because you just didn't work hard enough. And we think this is especially pernicious because firstly, banks and institutions use the same narrative as well. Because we think that whilst we want to give you things like food stamps, you have to work on your own. That just because you don't, then you're a welfare queen. You are a leech to society. And we think this is especially bad with how these people are viewed. But more perniciously, the language is like appropriated by both sets of people, like both the conservatives and the liberals. Ostensibly, the conservatives would say, you're a leech, you're a welfare queen, like in the heights of the Reagan administration. But on the liberal side of things, they also use that same kind of language. They say, we think people in the middle and upper levels of society ought to give back so the poorer people can be enriched. That we can hand down our hand and bring you up the level of life. In the same kind of language as well. So what does that do? It becomes especially restrictive and it becomes especially important the way people are viewed. Secondly, the people who ought to help lower levels of people don't really do it. What, has happens, with, what happens is a byproduct of consumerism. The middle classes and the rich people are able to buy things for themselves and they fashion in the very distinctive worlds for themselves that stand in stark opposition to how poor people live their lives. What does this do? Then based on their own experience, they would say, in my circumstance, I did this and I was okay. Without realizing and being able to connect the separate worlds that poor people live in. And then they apply those same standards to poor people as well. And on that function, they become, they become allergic to things like higher taxes. Right. Because to them, they didn't need the benefit of higher taxes to get where they are. And we think it's especially bad because these people from the lower levels of society can't go up. Next, and we think it's especially bad as well, crowding out. No, no, thank you. Firstly, let's look at consumerism as a measure of success. Why is it so bad and why does it crowd out other conceptions of success? Firstly, because it is the most quantifiable, it is the most tangible, and you've got to understand it's one of the most relational as well. Let me explain what this means. This means that across any level of society, consumerism and success and opulence is one of the easiest things that everybody shares. I am rich, you are not, you could have access to it. And what this does is that because everybody can gain access to this conception, it becomes the predominant narrative in these societies. But more importantly, what happens is that it's self-perpetuating. When I'm rich, I have access yes. to things like political institutions and media institutions that then allows this particular conception to be perpetuated. Because what it does is that once I'm in control of things like political institutions and media institutions, I emphasize things that make me different. My wealth, the fact that my wealth translates to political influence and political power. Sure. What this then means is that everybody who wants to be somebody in society to have that same measure of influence would have to be rich first. And what this does is that it crowds other conception. So why is this so, so bad? Because it allows rich people to be able the freedom to pursue other conceptions of success while other people can't. Let's walk through this. If I'm a rich person, and consumerism and opulence is a measure of success, I've got that box checked. So what I'm free to do then is to pursue other conceptions of success. 
Now, if I'm a poor person, I can't even fulfill that particular one, the one that is the most predominant narrative in society. I am denied from doing so, and I can't even go and pursue other conceptions of success. So what this does is that it's favorable only to a particular class of people in society that self-perpetuates it as well since they have control of political and media institutions that continually perpetuate that message. Let's go on to the next benefit, the next argument. Why this is unfair from the beginning? We think this is principally unfair as well because when you use consumerism as a measure of success, you've got to recognize that it's unequal from the very beginning. Meaning that if I'm born rich, I have access to money that I can invest, put into a fixed security deposit, earn like interest out of it, and I can use that same money to open doors that poor people would not have. What it means is that from the start, I already have a comparative advantage among other people. We think this is not the best measure of success. We think the best measure of success ought to be one where there's a level playing field from the start, and then you prove that you're able to do it on your own accord and beat these other people based on the same terms. That doesn't happen. We understand, right? You might say, how about like, what if my conception of success is that I want to be a really good footballer? Wouldn't that be pred uh, predicated on like certain unfair comparative advantages that come from the start? Well, we agree, and we think so too. And we reject these kind of conceptions as well, as long as they are unequal from the very beginning. Now the last point is substantive, the work hours thing. Let's examine at what point consumerism became a measure of success. This stem about when people started working longer hours to support the capitalist structures of societies. Because they have very little hours to themselves, and they have some access to money, they use that money to buy themselves goods, so they can feel happy for themselves for a very short period of time. But the problem with this is that they're caught in that cycle again and again and unable to truly derive happiness from these small things. Because if I have to work long hours to get that bit of money to buy stuff that makes me happy for a short time, I still have to continually work those long hours so I can continually have access to that bit of money that I can then buy stuff to make me happy in short spurts of time down the road. This is a fact that we three lawyers are very alive to. And we think it's especially bad because it's not true happiness that you're deriving right now, but you're basically a hamster on a wheel. And we think this is especially bad because we've seen the effects right, in countries like Japan where suicide rates were really high when people finally broke under the stress of such a system. So because this crowds out other conception of happiness, because it is especially an inherently insidious, we're very proud to propose.